Good morning. My name is Scott Kuman. It's a joy to be with you here this morning at Faith Community CRC. I am an Army chaplain on active duty, uh, endorsed by the Christian Reformed Church, of course. Um, I have been born and raised in West Michigan, uh, born and raised actually in Hudsonville. I know that uh, there might be a family or two that comes here from Hudsonville. And uh, I have uh, been out of uh, schooling and such for 20 years and part-time and, uh, and then full-time at a church in Hudsonville. And then in 2003, uh, my wife and I really sensed a, a draw and a call to active duty chaplaincy in the Army. Actually, I joined the Army mere, in mere days before we invaded Iraq and uh, that kind of set the tone and um, uh, you might say impacted our life quite a bit. Uh, from there forward. Uh, we currently live in Hudsonville now. Um, I'm not retired. Some people think that because I'm back in Hudsonville, I'm retired from the Army, and uh, I'm not. I'm actually stationed in Detroit, and uh, next summer, 2021, I will be taking our next assignment someplace in the country, uh, someplace else. Who knows? Lord does. Uh, let's see. Um, been married for 25 years and have three kids and we are uh, we're enjoying it back here in, in West Michigan and so uh, this morning it is a joy for me to be with you uh, although I would have much preferred the parking lot and get to meet and greet uh, many of you uh, even if is at it even if it is at a distance with this whole COVID-19 but uh, nonetheless this morning I look forward to uh, just spending some time in, in the Word of God with you and uh, leading in worship. Um, and with that, uh, I'm just going to transition. And so receive now God's greeting to you. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise this morning as we hear the thunder and the rain. Uh, again, a testimony of your faithfulness to your creation as you water the earth and you bring life. Lord, you bring life into our lives uh, through your salvation, through your salva salvific work in Christ Jesus. And we are grateful, Lord, we praise you. And as why we are worshiping you this morning, and as why we worship you each and every day of our lives, where our hearts are filled and overflow with gratitude, knowing who you are and what you have done for us while we were yet sinners. And Lord, we give you thanks and praise that we can uh, take this time this morning to calm our hearts and our minds and worship you. You are the living God. We pray this in Christ Jesus, amen. This, this morning's scripture passage comes from Colossians. Colossians chapter two starting at verse 8. Paul says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ... All the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive in, with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailed it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a, a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. 
This ends the reading of God's word. Paul starts out and he says these rather alarming words. See to it that no one takes you captive. Now, for you and me living here in West Michigan, this, this seems like a far off concept taking captive, and unless you've been taken captive in a war, uh, you would have, this This is like a foreign concept. This is like talking about icebergs. While those icebergs are in the North Atlantic and we can't even, we can't comprehend icebergs. We, we can read about them and think about them perhaps, but we've never seen and touched and experienced. And I, so this idea here, see to it that no one takes you captive. Now, in 2003, we were pushing across the desert in Kuwait. And I remember vividly the experience of driving through the desert of Kuwait, crossing over and through a berm uh, that was in the desert. The, the, the army engineers had pushed open a berm, uh, an opening in the berm that had separated the two countries. And it enabled all the U.S. armed forces to pour through this, this opening. And I recall that moment in the afternoon, filled with dust, knowing we were entering a country that did not welcome us. And through that afternoon and evening, we found ourselves constantly uh, experiencing being bogged down in the desert, stuck in the sand, and it cost us precious time. And one of my battalions, so of my people, I was a battalion chaplain in the 552, one of our companies, the 507th Maintenance Company, was the rear echelon. They were, the, they were behind the rear of everything moving into Iraq. And I remember the next day, after having pushed all afternoon, all morning, afternoon, and night, through the night, and into the next day, I remember we were leaving our refueling point and the 507th Maintenance Company was just arriving. We were just leaving, had just a few minutes of overlap and already realizing then that this was not ideal. To make a long story short, it is that event that set them so far back that then the, that very night on the 23rd of March, 2003, Captain Troy King and uh, his portion of the convoy missed a critical turn and they proceeded further down the road uh, before turning and they came to this this place in the desert where it was filled with lights they didn't understand where they were they thought it was a foundry when in fact it was the city of Anazaria and our intelligence in the army had told us that the Iraqi army was going to capitulate meaning they were going to as they encountered our forces they were going to just simply give up and let us walk in and, and take over. They were going to surrender because they had remembered what had happened just 12 years earlier when uh, we had been there and decimated Saddam's army. Troy King's unit went into the city and the guard with an AK-47 around his chest merely waved at Troy King and his soldiers which lended itself to the notion of the enemy capitulating. They drove through the city, and this is a very, very long and lengthy briefing to go into all the details, but in essence, they realized they had made a wrong turn. They turned the convoy around, several delays took place, and they got shot on their way out. They got hit by the enemy, and uh, nine of his soldiers, Nine of my soldiers uh, were killed that day, one of which I had just baptized 
a week and a half prior, James Keel. But six of them, six of our soldiers were taken prisoner of war. Shoshana Johnson was one of them, a uh, young African-American uh, soldier who she, uh, she had a, a child back home and she was taken prisoner of war with them. You may remember another name, Jessica Lynch. She was another prisoner of war. But being a prisoner of war, being held captive, the uncertainty that surrounded that event uh, was, was palpable. It was, uh, or was it palpable? You could just, you could feel the, the tension. You could feel the anxiety in all the soldiers in our battalion. The commander, everyone, day after day after day, the uncertainty of, uh, of not knowing what was happening to our soldiers who were held as prisoners of war. Paul is addressing the believers in Colossae. And he says, see to it that no one takes you captive. This, this idea of being taken captive is, is alarming and it is powerful. And it should cause us, it should cause us alarm. It should cause you and me also to really slow down this passage and, and take close and careful note. What is it that Paul is concerned about with the Colossians? What is it that we need to be concerned about today? And what are the implications? Well, first off, he names it. He says that they will take captive those who are not prepared with hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ today. There's no question about it. We are not living in a Christian-friendly culture. No one really wants to or needs to even discuss or debate that. We know that, that uh, living here in North America is not necessarily Christian-friendly. And that's a whole other matter. But when it comes to scriptural teaching, we expect the world not to be friendly to Christ and to be friendly to Christians. But when that, that animosity, when that, when that disdain starts to enter into our own, our own fellowship, that is where it becomes a concern and an alarm. And this is where Paul is talking, because there's people who have infiltrated the church in Colossae who are beginning to teach things that are contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul is warning them. Paul is warning us. And we need to take heed through the power of the Holy Spirit. What is it that we need to be careful of? Faith Community CRC, I unfortunately have no idea uh, about the fellowship here, other than we are in fellowship together through the Christian Reformed Church. I have no knowledge, I have no um, interaction with any of your members. Uh, and again, it is a pleasure to be here as a pastor, uh, as, a, as a guest pastor this morning. As a whole, Christianity in North America is under attack. And it's not a, under a, a very overt, direct attack. It's also underneath, it's in the current of our, of our, of our schools, our universities, our our college campuses, the statistic I came across this past week, Pew Research finds that 70%, 70% of our young people who have been raised in a God-fearing Christian home, go off, who have gone off to university, leave the Christian faith. Perhaps that's a smaller number when they go to places like Calvin or Hope or Trinity or Dort or Kuiper, but we would be foolish to think that, um, that even in our own midst, we, uh, we are, uh, that we are inoculated against such false teachings. 
I do know, I spoke a, a few years ago to a young man who had just graduated from one of these Christian colleges. I will remain unnamed because um, it's very near and dear to all of our hearts. And he, he's, I asked him about his experience. I didn't go to that particular school. Um, I went to Reform Bible College, now it's called Kuiper. And I was asking him about his experience and he told me a story that was very alarming. He said, on day one of class, it was a science class, the professor asked everyone to raise their hand if they believed in a, a literal seven day creation. And he said virtually the entire class raised his hand. And then the professor said, it's my goal to have, have no hands raised by the end of this semester. In other words, I will disprove the seven day understanding of creation and that science debunks it. That's coming from one of our own schools. So that just gives you a little taste that this is not something that we can say is out there. Brothers and sisters, the danger is real. The danger is already within our communities. And we have to understand that unless we identify it and unless we can understand, and unless we can understand what the truth is, we are in many ways setting ourselves up for failure. Uh, one of our sister denominations in the Netherlands, the Chera from Mir de Kirk in the Netherlands, the GKN, is no longer. In 2004, they, they melded in with all the other Protestant churches in the Netherlands. I remember hearing one of their preachers uh, speak in one of our churches here in, in the CRC, and uh, Jesus didn't literally walk on water. That was a figure of speech as he was his conquering over death, in that uh, it was a mystical, whatever. So the point is here that Paul is saying, do not be deceived. So you say, well, how do I know if I've been deceived? How do I know if there are, if there are teachings already in my midst? John, uh, John Piper says this, he says, if you cannot identify any voices you hear as false, it's not because you aren't being exposed, but because you're falling for it in some way. And so that's why the question, what? What might we be looking for today? What are the things that we should be thinking about that would indicate to us that perhaps there's a compromise of the gospel? The first and simplest question that all of us have to answer, is Christ Jesus primary? In my life? Is Christ Jesus the very center and is he at the very apex of my life? And maybe then secondly, right behind it, is he also, is Christ at the very center of my church's teaching? Secondly, another one, and these are, this is not by any means an exhaustive list of to do's and don'ts, but a litmus test just to kind of quick, do a quick overview is sin really sin, or is it merely an archaic term? Do you find yourself using these words or reading them, and yes, even in our own publication for our, our church, euphemistic terms for sin? Brokenness. Is it merely brokenness? And are we merely on a path of understanding what our understanding of brokenness is? Or, or really, uh, is it just some imperfections that we need to, to address? After all, nobody's perfect, right? Is Jesus merely a moral teacher who gives psychological tips of how to live a better life? Because if Jesus is a sort of a good teacher that shows us what uh, right looks like, uh, Maybe, maybe Jesus just uh, came to show us what real social justice is about and how to do social justice the right way. Or is Christ your, big word, propitiating sacrifice? Is Jesus the sacrifice that stands in the way of God's wrath? 
Because if Christ is merely a, a teacher to teach us and help us uh, how to become uh, better warriors and for social justice, well, we've already given up the fight. We've already lost the gospel. And then we need to get it back. Or is Christ truly at the center of everything? in our lives and our understanding of truth and doctrine of of right relationship with with God the Father through faith in Jesus Christ and Paul gets at this in this passage and he's gonna break it down for us because he no longer he, he, he addresses the idea of the deceptive philosophies that depend on human tradition and then he begins to walk us through what right teaching is the uh, secret service when it teaches its new agents how to identify a counterfeit bill they do not set them in a classroom and show them what counterfeits can look like they don't spend a lot of time looking at counterfeits and looking at all the flaws of counterfeit printing and what to look for and nor do we in the church spend all of our time looking for counterfeit gospels and false teaching. Instead, the Secret Service spends its time teaching its agents how to take a bill and study what perfection looks like, absolute perfection of what it is that the U.S. Treasury prints and what that bill is supposed to look like. And they study it, and they study it in all of its detail to know exactly what a U.S. bill looks like so that when they do see a counterfeit, it stands out immediately. Brothers and sisters, the same goes for us. We have to understand what the gospel is, what it looks like, how our lives are wrapped and shaped in Christ Jesus, the process, the understanding of who he is. Then we will know false teaching. So the first point this morning is do not be deceived. Do not be deceived by false teachers. And, and with that, not being deceived, knowing that they are there. We have false teaching in our midst. It, it's here, brothers and sisters. There are indications that it's here. Secondly, not only do we have to avoid being deceived, we have to remember who we are in Christ. And Paul spends some good time and very thorough detail walking us through who we are in Christ. So number two, who are we in Christ? Let's pick up at verse 11. He says this, In him, meaning Christ, you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ. Now, circumcision is a very violent, um, very uh, strong visual of something that takes place, and it's that Christ removes from us. He cuts away from us the old self. It is gone. It is cut from us. It is gone. It is removed. And it's not done with human hands, but with Christ. The Holy Spirit is the one who does this. And it's in the Old Testament, this, this already the foreshadowing, the, the explaining. He says in, in Ezekiel chapter 11 that men have hearts of stone, but that he will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. That circumcision, that changing, the, the old is gone, the, the new has come. It is a cutting away. And what that means, brothers and sisters, is simply this, that when you and I, come into a relationship with Jesus Christ through our confession of our sin, real sin, not a problem I have, not a little issue I have, but my sin. When Christ, when I surrender my sin to Jesus Christ, you surrender your sin to Jesus Christ, there is a cutting away of the old self. He goes on, not only is there the cutting away and the putting off of the sinful nature, verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism. 
And so what we have here is a putting off of the old self, then in that moment when we put off the old self, the Holy Spirit, we confess our sin, takes our sin away from us, removes it, the old is gone, we, we have died to self, and in that moment, there is a burial. We, we spiritually die to ourselves as Christ died on the cross, and we are buried with Christ. Then, moving on, he says, not only are you, you buried, having been buried with him in baptism, we have then been raised with him through our faith. So there's this, there is the circumcision, there is the being buried, we have that baptism experience that puts us in the grave, that we die to self, we are done, it's gone, and at this point, we are no longer. And then, on the third day, as Christ rose from the dead, that is the guarantee. That's the hope. That is the, the promise, the assurance that as surely as Christ died and as surely as Christ rose, you and I too not only have died to self, died to our sin, put it off, Holy Spirit cutting it away. We have died and been buried. We then are raised with Christ. We are no longer the old self. That is gone. Every metaphor, every visual, everything to describe the old being gone is done. Put it in the past. We are moving forward in life in Jesus Christ. As he rose, we rise, the new self. And as, uh, we, as they were commanded in the Old Testament not to look back, like Lot and his wife leaving Sodom and Gomorrah, we do not look back back at the old life. Instead, we look forward. We are forward looking at Christ, the redemption that is ours in him, our new life, being raised. We are alive. Having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead, when you were dead in your sins and in uncircumcision, the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us. Now, we get to this, this part in verse 14. Where he, he says we're free from our legal indebtedness. Having canceled the written code, with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us, taking it and nailing it to the cross. Brothers and sisters, this is where you and I have victory. Not that we ourselves have attained anything. Christ did it all. He did it all, and it is by your faith, it is by my faith that his righteous work on the cross is attributed to you and me. It is attributed to us. And, and to understand this a little bit differently, this, this penalty, this written code, by nature, our sin is what separates us. It alienates us from the Father. Now, this is kind of hard to, to conceptualize and understand, especially when we have been born and raised in a church and we've been going to church since we can remember we were walking. And it's a little bit hard for us sometimes to make the, the distinction um, when we have been raised in a covenant community of faith and we have seen and experienced the love and the grace of God in our lives our whole life. Unless we can slow this film down and really lean on and learn from Scripture's teaching, the Bible, God's Word. It is possible for us to miss these important nuances. And it's critical. Brothers and sisters, there is nothing to be, uh, to be playing with here. The work of Christ in His sacrifice is everything. If we get this wrong, we misunderstand it, we don't appreciate it, we can sell the whole farm for pennies on a dollar. 
and, uh, and walk away and have nothing in our hands. The work of Christ at its very essence is nothing short of miraculous. It is God's wrath being poured out against sin. You and I stand in, without Christ, we would be obliterated by God's wrath because God is so holy, he cannot tolerate, he cannot have sin in his presence. There's no way we could have a right relationship with, with God. Jesus steps in the way, and on the cross, he becomes that sacrifice. Encountering the full wrath of God, impacting his life, crushing him, causing his death. And at that moment, he absorbs the full wrath of God against sin. And here's the key. It only applies to those of us who place our faith in Jesus Christ. You may have friends. I have friends. I have many soldiers that I, I know and have, have worked with in the past and work with currently who um, talking about sin is not easy. Um, and for most of them, they have no trouble with uh, presenting all of their flaws and, and being unashamed of their choices in life and their decisions and how they act and how they treat one another. Um, it is sometimes it's quite shocking and appalling, but uh, that's the world. Um, but at no point in time have you or I been given permission to downplay the significance of sin. We have, uh, that's, that's what separates us by nature uh, from God. So by all means, sin is sin. People want to call it brokenness. People want to call it, um, you know, uh, flaws or imperfections. Minimizing the size and the, the scope and the impact of sin is also then in turn to minimize and shrink and diminish the importance of Christ's atoning sacrifice, his death and his resurrection. And so as we understand who we are, we also, in closing, need to understand that Christ is the ruler. He's triumphant. He has conquered the grave. He has conquered death. There, there is a day coming when he returns. We may see him before that with, uh, with our own death from this life, but Christ returns. He is victorious. He, he has conquered the devil and all of his schemes. Uh, 1 John 3 tells us the reason that Jesus came is to destroy the works of the devil. Christ is victorious, and he is then also the judge. And brothers and sisters, there's really, there's only two choices. There's only two outcomes for you and for me. Only two. And uh, it's important for us to keep this in our awareness, in our day-to-day -day living, and helping others around us who have not yet experienced the grace, the love, and the peace, and the forgiveness of Christ for their sin. There are so many of our friends and neighbors and, and loved ones who, who have to hear the truth of who they are, and they need to repent and have to come into a right relationship with Christ and, and ask for forgiveness of their sin. You and I have done that if we put our faith in him already. Because really, we know there's only two ways this ends for us, brothers and sisters. There is the experience, as, as Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, which means the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And Jesus says to them, Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoer. Brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but those words are 
they are equally as concerning and alarming. That strikes, it strikes concern in my heart. I, these, this isn't somebody who said, you know, basically I've told you to go pound sand all my life, Jesus. I don't care about you. That's not who Jesus is talking to. That's an e easy decision. That's easy for us to see as believers that on the day of judgment, those who have rejected Christ openly, you know, and wanted nothing to do with him, of course we know what that outcome looks like. But Jesus is talking to, to those who say, did we not prophesy and cast out demons in your name? And he says to them, away from me. When I read this, forces me to take inventory of my heart and to just come to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, please show me what is it that I am not believing rightly, that I am not living rightly, that I am not obeying. Have your way with me. Open up my heart. Expose it. Show me what it is that I must do. If we can come to the Lord with that degree of honesty, seeking after him, spending time in his holy word, not in the books of those and in the articles of those written to help us with how to have a better Christian life, but which is probably okay in many instances, but spending time in his word. Brothers and sisters, the most beautiful words in scripture are what we all long to hear. When he says in Matthew 25, 21, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and enjoy your master's happiness. We will know then that we are not captive. We will know then that we were not taken captive, and that is our assurance in, in late April. So the 507th Maintenance Company, with the attack that happened on the 23rd of March, um, it was just about three weeks later, when a, uh, a group, when Shoshana Johnson had, uh, she gives her testimony, says that she was not permitted as a prisoner of war to ever speak out loud and talk to the other prisoners. None of the prisoners were able to communicate. And it was after these weeks had gone by, she would sing one song at least once a day sometimes more than once a day it was a song that we sang at the end of every chapel service when we were still in kuwait it was amazing grace and she said when she sang amazing grace none of the guards stopped her from singing none of the guards interrupted her and she was able to sing that song each day as a captive in prison. What she did not know until afterward is that the guards had orders from higher uh, in the I Iraqi army that if the American forces were going to liberate the prisoners, that the guards had orders to shoot each of the prisoners of war. And by God's grace and Shoshana's faithfulness in singing Amazing Grace each day. It changed. It, it impacted the heart of one Iraqi guard. And this Iraqi guard reached out to a fam family member there in the city of Baghdad. They'd already moved the prisoners multiple times as American forces were growing closer and closer and ready to discover their position. And um, this guard reached out to a family member and said, contact the nearest U.S. forces and um, let them know where we're located with these prisoners. And sure enough, immediately uh, a team was assembled and they came in and liberated them so that Shoshana and the others were all set free. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Brothers and sisters, by God's grace, we have been set free. By God's grace, we are aware of our own sin and our need for a Savior. By God's grace, we know the truth and we have been set free. And we experience that freedom in Christ. Be vigilant. Be on guard. Know the gospel and know 
Know who Christ is, know who you are, and do not be deceived. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise again for this day, this opportunity. Lord, help us always to be vigilant, to be on guard, and to know that there are lies around us. There are compromises around us. Help us, Lord, to understand our identity in you, understand who you are and all that you have done for us. Lord, we again worship you with gratitude in our hearts, grateful and thankful for all that you have done. We ask that you would uh, continue to walk with us, enjoy, and encourage us, lift us up, teach us, guide us each step of the way, that we may always glorify you and seek to glorify you now and forever. In Christ Jesus, amen. Receive now God's parting blessing. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Christ Jesus, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.